Thank you all for staying. says the stream is live now, so I guess we're good to go. All right, thank you all for bearing with us this morning uh, under some strange circumstances for sure. Uh, if you'll give us just one moment uh, to give everyone a chance, uh, at least everyone that's been able to hang around, uh, a chance to find the new link and uh, get here onto the live stream, and we'll start back in just a moment. Uh, I'll be back, and we'll have our sermon uh, in just a second. Uh, yes, and again, um, tonight uh, we will still have the celebration dinner. Uh, that is still on uh, due to the fact that there are multiple churches that are involved and, and pastors from uh, several different churches. Uh, we're still able to have that um, uh, gathering this evening. So please go and uh, enjoy yourselves uh, enjoy the, the program, enjoy the food, and, um, and just have a, a great time together in the Lord. And, and again, uh, I was going to say this anyway, but I just want to uh, thank you um, for your flexibility, uh, even more than I thought you were going to need, frankly, uh, when I uh, got here uh, this morning, uh, for being flexible about uh, being in the building and flexible uh, for kind of the perfect storm of events that, that has led us to uh, where we are uh, today. And so pray for uh, the pastor's families that are uh, experiencing uh, the, the effects of COVID so far. Uh, folks, I think, seem to be doing uh, fairly well um, and and just pray that God would continue to uh, pour his grace out upon our uh, congregation. And thank you for uh, your support and encouragement to the pastors and the staff uh, over these last really nine months now as we have sought to, to navigate the ever-changing waters of a global pandemic and, uh, and as we saw this morning, the gremlins of technology. So... Uh, without any further ado, and with all that being said, let's dive today into Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. In the 1980s, uh, when I was growing up, it seems like forever ago, uh, back then you actually had to watch commercials. And one product, Head & Shoulders Shampoo, had constructed their commercial so that one of the characters in the commercial would see a bottle of head and shoulders shampoo in uh, the travel uh, bag of a colleague or laying around at their house, although that seems a bit invasive of their privacy, I guess. And they would say something like this, I didn't know that you had dandruff. To which the bottle owner, in a very earnest tone, with an earnest look far more serious than shampoo, would say, I don't. The commercial would then cut to someone saying the tagline, head and shoulders, 
because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. The first time that you meet someone can strangely define your relationship with that person. When you go for a job interview, you want to look like you have things together, even if that may not necessarily be the case, that you're competent, that you will be a good employee. When you're set up for a blind date or meet someone through a dating website, you don't want to look like a slob, at least if you want to have a second date. These days, this idea of you never get a second chance to make a first impression is shown in those half-washed Downey commercials. A first impression matters and sets trajectories that last for years. For me, this feeling that comes from first impressions is one that that repeats itself almost every semester as I get ready to teach the first classes um, at North Greenville University. This week I was going through my office looking for some notes that I've not needed in years and at the bottom of a pile of papers I came across the attendance sheet from the very first class that I ever taught at North Greenville University a little more than 15 years ago. Now, I would like for you to overlook the pack rat nature uh, and hoarding nature that I have that this uh, piece of paper demonstrates. But when I saw that piece of paper, it brought back a ton of memories. It was an intermediate Greek 1 class that met at 11 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Well, at least when chapel ended on time. And I had taught Greek for around five years on the graduate level at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. But when I came to North Greenville and was standing in front of a group of guys who were in now their third semester of Greek, to be honest, I was a little nervous because they had been taught by someone else for the past year, and now I was attempting to fill his shoes by teaching what felt like his class. On that first day, I dressed in a suit and tie, a black suit with a red tie, and that's why I decided uh, to wear a coat and tie. I haven't done that in a while uh, here at TCC. In honor of that class and in honor of some very encouraging harassment that I received last week for preaching in jeans, maybe for the first time. Well, I went to that class, I had my syllabus ready, and we hit the ground running. I wanted them to know that I meant business. We went over the schedule for the class, I informed them on this first day of class, it was a Wednesday, I believe, that they were going to have a test on the following Monday over everything that they had learned in first year Greek. My reasoning for doing this was that I needed to know exactly what or what they did not know and honestly, frankly, who I was dealing with so that I could get moving forward at the beginning of the next week. I was not doing this to intimidate them or because I was necessarily mean, but because I wanted to learn to the best of my ability what their abilities were were. I do not, however, think that it was taken that way because later on I learned that they started very quickly calling me El Diablo behind my back. And then to my face, you can tell that the relationship kind of changed. I think at first they thought that I was evil and mean like the devil, but eventually, eventually it became a term of endearment. In fact, I even performed the wedding ceremony for one of the guys in that class. So this morning, as we look at Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39, we have another kind of set of first impressions. Our first impression of John, who will come to be known as the Baptist, and Jesus. So what kind of first impression will we receive about them? Will we find some interesting things about John? Will it 
match with what we've already heard, or will it be different? Well, we're going to find that John recognizes that he already, while he's still in his mother's womb, is in the presence of Jesus, who, by the way, is also in his mother's womb. And we're going to come to find out that Luke is going to imply for us and make the case in a very subtle way that this child that Mary is carrying is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. And we're going to understand more about this greatness that Gabriel proclaimed as we learn about this first impression of John and Jesus. Let's read what the scripture says. Oh, by the way, I forgot this was here. It's just like the day's been going. We still have head and shoulders. We still have their commercials. Now they're just a little more hip with athletes. All right, so. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is powerful. That your word is at work. That your word is inspired by your spirit to the fact that every word that Luke wrote was your word. That he, under the inspiration of the Spirit, constructed these stories to bring out very important truths that we need to know and we need to hear. And we, we pray that the Spirit who inspired these words would be at work in us even as we are a bit scattered this morning, even as we are forced uh, to meet uh, through the, the, this technology that you have given us that can be both a great blessing and sometimes even a great frustration. And so Lord, I pray that, that this morning that you would that you would settle our hearts, that you would settle our minds, that you would uh, remove the distraction that the troubles of this morning have created. Whether it be a, um, a frustration with a child or a frustration with technology, we know, Lord, that, that you are at work in all things that you are accomplishing your purposes and that 
that you want us to draw near to you, to hear from you. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to accomplish your purposes through the reading and teaching of your word, through the the circumstances of the morning that maybe haven't gone exactly the way we would have liked, but that we could find our rest in you, we could find our hope in you, we could find our joy in you, and that through our time together, you would transform us. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So in our passage today, Luke ties together the two stories that have been going on throughout the previous verses of the first chapter, the, those uh, texts that we looked at last Sunday. So on this occasion, Mary leaves Nazareth very quickly. Uh, it almost seems as though to get confirmation of the sign that Gabriel gave her about Elizabeth. And she goes to the hill country of Judea. Notice Luke doesn't even tell us where. It's not really all that important because everything is meant to point to Jesus. And when she gets there, we see the bringing together of these two streams. We've had Gabriel's prophecy to Zechariah, Gabriel's prophecy to Mary. They come together in this moment that is kind of, in some ways, the soaring event of the birth narrative. How it's built up to this point. How we've got this arc going up to this encounter between these two women and their two sons that's going to lead then into the birth of John the Baptist, followed by the birth of Jesus. And all of this is filled with and is just overcome with the joy that we're going to find here in this text. And so when she gets there to see her relative Elizabeth, who also is about to give birth to a miraculous child, we're going to find out from the very beginning that this baby prophesied by the angel to Zechariah is even before his birth going to prepare the way for the coming of God. For the coming of God the Son. So in the course of this encounter, we're going to receive confirmation. You remember we talked last week about how Luke is trying to give confirmation to Theophilus of all the things that he's been taught. Well, Zechariah and Mary received prophecies and very quickly, there are not years to wait, not really even weeks or months to wait, but seemingly days to wait for the prophecy to be fulfilled. God is actively involved in all of the events that are taking place to bring his blessing to the world, to bring his forgiveness and salvation to the world. So let's see how this passage unfolds. The first thing we're going to see is that God confirms his promises. He does this in verses 39 to 30, or 41. So God confirms his promises. So let's look at what the scripture says. In those days, Mary set out and hurried. We saw this earlier. She's going to find out very hurriedly, very quickly, what it is that is taking place with Elizabeth. She's seen this, uh, heard this word from Gabriel that her cousin Elizabeth, who is very old and unable to have baby, a baby, is going to have a child. And so she goes to get that confirmation. She goes to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. But notice what Luke tells us in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. So notice, again, no contact, no information. There's nothing that Elizabeth would have known at all about what was going on with Mary. There's, there, there, there is no way for them really to pass along this information. And even if there were a way to pass along this information in the 60 to 80 miles different uh, distance that they lived away from one another, 
it would not have been easily conveyed. And so Elizabeth knows nothing. This is how miraculous this event. Elizabeth knows nothing about what's been going on in Mary's life. But upon the hearing of her voice, no content, nothing said other than hello. Or maybe shalom. She hears the greeting. The baby leaped inside her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a pretty amazing thing. Upon hearing the voice of Mary calling out to his mother, John the Baptist, Zechariah's son, still in his mother's womb, leaps with excitement over being in the presence of the one for whom he has been created by God, the Father, to prepare the way. So God has fulfilled his promise about Zechariah's son. God is at work. God is doing amazing things. So let's ask ourselves, how are the ways in which, maybe what are the ways that God is doing this? Now notice what happens here. John's leap causes Elizabeth to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just be honest, that's a bit strange. Normally, when we think about somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, now that the, 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 this new era of salvation has come in the death and resurrection of Jesus, as we look back over these last 2,000 years of Christian history, we think somebody receives the Spirit because they've repented and believed in Christ. But here, something very strange and frankly kind of one-off happens because the baby's filling of the Spirit is going to result in the filling of His Mother. The fact that his mother is immediately filled with the Holy Spirit in response to his leaping in the womb implies at least, and I think actually says quite loudly, that this miraculous child is already filled with the Spirit. And remember, that's exactly what Gabriel said was going to happen. In Luke 1.15, at the end of the verse, he says he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. That seems unbelievable. It seems impossible. It seems like that is not going to happen regularly. And frankly, it doesn't. But it happens here. And it reminds us of places even in the Old Testament where the prophets describe that they are called from their mother's womb. And so if you're reading this with an eye to the whole of the scriptures, you're seeing not only has this been prophesied about John, it also should cause us to go back and think about prophets like Jeremiah to recognize this man is a prophet who is going to preach about repentance, who is going to call the people to be ready for the coming of God to them so that when he comes, he will come in mercy and not in judgment. So John and subsequently his mother are the first people to recognize the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Savior of his people. That Jesus, as we're going to see as this passage unfolds, that Jesus is God, our Savior. And this response of John the Baptist is indicative of how people are to receive Jesus, how they are to receive the gospel about Jesus, even till today. Today, as we gather virtually all over our city, and maybe some even watching in other parts of the world, today as we gather together, there should be great excitement that even overcomes frustrations and difficulties and distractions that the day has already brought. We should be able to gather together and to uh, ponder with great excitement the fact that we can even now encounter Jesus the Messiah. Now, it's pretty strange, let's just be honest, to be able to encounter and worship and celebrate Jesus while he's still in his mother's womb. But let's just be honest, it's even 
more beyond belief to recognize the fact that our Savior, our King Jesus, lived a perfect life, that he died in the place of sinners. He died in our place, the innocent, in the place of the guilty. And God then raised him back to life again. He resurrected him from the dead to never, ever die again. He glorified that physical body that Jesus had to show that he was fully man. And now he sits at the right hand, of, as Luke says, of the power of God reigning and ruling. And that is an amazing thing, even frankly, I think, more amazing than them worshiping a baby in a womb. But we can do that today. With all of the, the difficulties of life and all of the frustrations of life, we can worship a risen Savior with great joy and excitement and anticipation because He is living and He reigns and He rules. And frankly, we should be ashamed of ourselves. If the, the frustrations of the day, the fears that come from a global pandemic should keep us from recognizing the greatness and the goodness and the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, John leaps for joy. And this morning, in the midst of whatever terrible things are going on in our lives, we we should be able to leap for joy. Now, some of our leaps might not be quite as high as they used to be, but leap for joy over what we have received in Christ. But he goes on from there. Not only does John leap for joy and cause his mom to be filled with the Holy Spirit, John prepares his mom, John prepares all of God's people for God's return to his people. Look at what we have here. We've already had this preparation. She is going to say some things in a moment. But remember, one more time, what happens back in chapter 1, verse 17. And pay really close attention to what we see here because it's going to be really significant. So we're, we're told there, He will go before Him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous. And then notice this last line. To make ready for, and there it is, the Lord, a prepared people. The fact that John gets excited by the sound of Mary's voice has nothing to do with Mary and everything to do with the fact that she is carrying, that she is carrying Jesus in her womb. This spirit-filled baby not only realizes that Mary is pregnant before it would have been easily noticed, his leaping for joy announces in full assurance of the fact, frankly, in full assurance of the fact that she is pregnant before it would be a socially appropriate thing to ask. But even beyond that, he's declaring by his action that the child she is carrying is the Messiah. Before anyone would have known, before anyone could have told, before anyone could have expected it, John, and by the way, without any advance notice for his mom, leaps in his mother's womb, indicating to her that something is going on. The Holy Spirit inspires her to recognize that, the, that Mary, this young girl who is still a virgin, has already conceived a child in confirmation of God's Word. You see, this response of Elizabeth is, is prophetic. She's confirming the prophetic word. She is also going to declare in the Spirit a prophetic word that we need to hear about Jesus an interesting thing is going on in this story. This child, John, is older than Jesus. 
And normally, in the Jewish way of understanding things, the older is more important than the younger. But even from before the time that they are born, the focus is put on the older serving and preparing the way for the younger. In a way, this story mirrors and transcends another story in the Bible where an older will serve the younger. You remember in Genesis 25, the story of Jacob and Esau, how they sort of leapt in their mother's womb. Now, obviously, this is a bit different. These are two boys in two different wombs. But this story is going to be radically different than the one that has come before. This time, God's promise will not be delivered through intrigue and through the selling of a birthright, but through the willing obedience of both men to the plan and the purpose of God. And so, God has fulfilled his promise to Zechariah, but also to Mary. God has fulfilled his promise to Mary about her son. She's pregnant. Mary is pregnant. And just like the angel has said, so is Elizabeth. Now remember, last week we saw that Mary asked this question, how's it going to be? And the angel gives her a sign, a quite positive sign, as in distinction from Zechariah's sign that he was not going to be able to speak. It's maybe why we don't see him in this story. But she gets this sign. She goes to the hill country. And when she gets to the hill country, the sign is fulfilled. The fact that Elizabeth is pregnant just makes it abundantly clear that she is going to have the baby. And now, whether she knew it or not, we don't know. But the baby makes it clear. Elizabeth's baby makes it clear. She's already pregnant. And it just reminds us, one more time, that God is sovereignly in control of everything. Everything that takes place in his creation, even technical glitches in the 21st century. And that God is in the process of accomplishing his plan to redeem his people and to redeem his creation. And the response is this. We see this, consider your relative Elizabeth. She's conceived a son. She's hidden it. And now, notice this response. John's joyous leap confirms that Jesus is already growing in Mary's belly. I never really had thought a whole lot about this until this week, but Mary very well could not have even known that she was pregnant. She just went quickly to see the sign. We don't know anything about the circumstances of how, of the when at least. We know about the how. The triune God is at work, but we don't know the when. And Mary might not have even known at this point that she was pregnant, but now she does. She's seen that Elizabeth is pregnant and now she knows because of this declaration of Elizabeth that is to follow and because of the leaping of the baby that everything is happening just like God said. So let's see the second thing here. The leaping of the baby leads to the prophetic word from Elizabeth. Elizabeth's praise of Jesus points to the fact that he is equal with God the Father, points to the fact that Jesus is God. Luke's description of the fact that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit means that she is a speaker who can be trusted. What she says about Mary, what she says about the child that Mary is carrying in her womb, is speech that is given by God. What makes the fact that she is speaking the words of God so significant is that there is no way in the world apart from 
the divine work of God by the Spirit to give her these words that she could have known anything about these circumstances. There was not a back and forth in the sign. Her sign was her husband was shut up. Not Mary, your cousin, is going to have a baby. But notice what happens. The basis here for Mary's blessedness, it comes from the blessedness of her son. So look at what we see there in verses 42 and 45. Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. We see this kind of language used in sort of hymnic, poetic texts in the Old Testament about the most blessed of women, uh, like Jael. Now, obviously, the circumstances, she's called the most blessed of tent-dwelling gals because she, well, hammers a tent peg through a dude's head. This is a bit less violent of a circumstance, for sure. But she is the most blessed, not because of herself, but because of her son. So she's called this blessed are you among women. And then this question from Elizabeth's mouth, how could this happen to me? That the mother, and notice what she says there, the mother of my Lord should come to me. And then notice down in verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. Now, remember, she doesn't know anything about that. This is something that is given to her by God. The blessing focuses on the fact that Mary has received a blessing from God, a gift from God to serve God in this way. The interesting thing about this blessing, though, is that it is proclaimed not as something desired or something that's hoped for, as is the more normal case with blessings. Like in Deuteronomy 27 to 30, where you have blessings that are desired and curses of the covenant that are not. Mary is blessed by God because of who it is that she has in her womb. In this period of Hebrew history, a woman's greatness was determined by the greatness of her children. Well, obviously, if her son is great, period, not great before the Lord, not great with any other qualifier, but great, then she certainly would surpass all the others. And the blessing finally comes to a close with a, a beatitude focused on Mary because she believed the message from the angel in distinction, by the way, from Elizabeth's husband, that she would conceive and bear a son who would be great, who would rule over the throne of David into eternity. It's all happening, just like God had said. But notice how it goes on. Did you see that with the Lord? One of the things that I want us to recognize is that Luke here in these very early verses is turning up very quietly and very subtly the volume on this piece of information that he wants his readers to recognize, embrace, and build their lives on. Jesus is God. Now, he doesn't have the system turned up to 12 like John does in his gospel. And, and as you're going to see in some of the Advent cards this week that declare that Jesus is God. But it's there if we have ears to hear. This word Lord is going to be used of Jesus in this passage. And it's also going to be used of God the Father in this passage. And if we're listening and if we're paying attention, we're beginning to get the seeds of understanding that this child who is described as great is equal with God the Father. That he, as we will come to find out, is unique and distinct from God the Father, but equal with and united with him. And there is blessing and joy that comes from recognizing all that God is doing in this event. 
So, blessing comes, and frankly, joy comes from believing in God's promises. Believing in God's promises. Look at what Luke says. How he describes Mary's question, how could this happen to me? It's very similar to what we saw with Mary. That the mother of my Lord should come to me. For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside of me. Elizabeth is humble. The visit of the Messiah to her home even as a baby, even as a baby so small that you couldn't even recognize that Mary was carrying him. She's humbled by this fact that God would use her and she's humbled by the fact that God's son would come to her home. Throughout this description of events, there is an overflowing of hope and happiness and joy. And that should be overflowing in our lives. You see, John knows even before his birth what God has called him to do. And that brings him great joy. You see, this response of joy to the calling that God has placed upon John is a great model for us. John is finding satisfaction. John is finding joy in the fact that God has a plan for his life and that following that plan results in great joy. And, and somewhere we've, I think, lost that. I think sometimes we get this idea that, that when God calls us to do things, it's kind of in a kicking and screaming sort of way. If it wasn't in a kicking and screaming sort of way, then how could we know that God was calling us? That is completely the opposite of what we see in the scriptures, or at least what is the rule in the scriptures. Certainly there are exceptions. But the rule is joy over the fact that God would give this gracious opportunity to serve. I, we need to realize that serving God should bring us joy and happiness, that it should be fun doing what God has called us to do. Now, that doesn't mean the road's always going to be easy. Certainly it wasn't for John. His life was quite literally cut short when his head was removed from his body. But he has joy in the fact that he can declare even before he's born that God is at work, that God is accomplishing his purposes, that God is coming back to his people. And frankly, for ones who've received the spirit, who know that God has come back to his people, the ones who are filled with the spirit, we should, and it's a gross word, but I want to use it so that you'll remember it. We should just ooze joy. It should come out of every pore in, of our bodies that we have been transformed by the grace of Christ, that we know Him, that joy should just flow out of us so that we can declare in full confidence that Jesus is life, that that he is the only path to flourishing, that following in his path, in his ways, is the only way to the satisfaction that we desire. You know, with our son Trace, he uh, oftentimes has a difficulty in, in, in recognizing other folks' emotions. He, he just doesn't, doesn't get it. It's the way that God has wired him. So like there were times when, when he was younger and I would be trying to, to sternly re rebuke him and, and get on to him for something that, that, I, that he had done that was wrong and, and I promise I didn't use the word rebuke. Uh, he would just look at me and laugh. And it would just infuriate me. 
But, but a few years later, and obviously it probably got him in a little bit of trouble that he would laugh in my face, as we were talking through with, with, with some of the folks that are helping him with therapy and understanding these things, they said, have you ever really thought about what your face looks like when you're angry to a child? Especially one that has a hard time understanding the context. It looks pretty ridiculous. You'd laugh too. And that was a pretty humiliating thing to realize. Like, he, he just didn't understand. And so, uh, we use these things. Amber is really great with it. Far better than I of using social stories and pictures to explain what's going on and to try to begin to process maybe in a bit of a different way how other folks are trying to convey their emotions. And, and let's just be honest, like what is the social story that we're conveying in the way that we carry ourselves from day to day as Christians? From the way that we uh, present ourselves online are we oozing joy and hope and satisfaction in Jesus or are we conveying something else? Are we conveying that the path of following Jesus and submitting to his rules and his way out of love and out of joy is the path to true flourishing or are we conveying something else? So maybe like I had to do, with my son, we need to think about what, what is the picture that our faces and our words and our actions are conveying about our king? Well, this brings us to the, the, the final point here, the, the, the hymn of, of Mary, where she praises God for his faithfulness. Uh, prophetic signs, like we've seen, need interpretation. When in the Old Testament, a prophet will, will do a physical act to convey something that God is doing, like the breaking of a clay pot or whatever it might be, there has to be explanation. So that's what Mary's hymn, oftentimes called the Magnificat from the first word of the hymn in Latin, she praises God for what he's going to do. So let's look at how this unfolds. As Mary praises God for his faithfulness, Mary exalts God and not herself. Notice what happens there in verses 46 and 47. And Mary said, and notice how it's set off a bit as a hymn in your Bibles, poetic text, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's essentially saying the same thing twice, a repetition of the idea for emphasis. It would have been very easy for Mary to get a little proud of her situation, given the fact that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. But her praise is centered in the proper place. Her praise is upon God and His Work. It's one of the things that uh, as you go to the Middle East, as you go to the Holy Land and you, you go into churches, one of the strange things that happens at times is in the artwork, particularly in Nazareth at the, the Church of the Annunciation, there's this idea of Mary even hovering over and being greater than her son. And you see none of that in Mary herself. Mary proclaims that from the very core of who she is, she is exalting the one true and living God, her Savior. She praises Him for the fact that He will now demonstrate in a new and mighty way through this child who will be her son, yes, the fact that God is the God who saves, that God is the one who brings an end to the destruction that sin brings in this world. He is going to once and for all forgive their sins. He is once and for all going to establish His kingdom. And all the promises of the prophets that seem to have been delayed are now going to be fulfilled. And so Mary exalts God, not herself. And then we're going to see Mary's role in God's salvation story embodies amazing grace. Look in verses 48 and 49. She says, Because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant, 
Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. In these two verses, Mary explains the reasons for the praise that she's offering up to God. Mary still understands that she has and had no reason to presume upon this great favor that she's received from God. Mary again acknowledges that she's one of the last people in the world that might be selected if this were based upon gifts, were based upon status. But nonetheless, God has chosen her. She is poor, and her son will be poor. He will, however, be great. He will be the Savior of the world. And the result of this gracious selection of God will be that she will be called blessed by all generations that are to come. God is intervening. God is returning because Jesus is God. Now, if we were to put ourselves in her shoes and had the time to reflect on all that God was doing in her life, If it were us, we might think that we were pretty great. We might think that we were pretty special. But Mary understands very well her place and her God, and that gives her joy. And Mary concludes the section with an emphasis on the, the set-apartness, the holiness, the consecratedness of her God. He is at work to bring His righteousness and His justice to bear. That brings us then to the next stage. This baby displays God's mercy to all who fear Him. So in verses 50 and 51, we see His mercy from generation to generation on those who fear Him. He has done a mighty deed with His arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Now now think about this for a second. Notice how in this prophetic word about the future, she's describing the whole of Jesus' life and the whole of all that he's accomplished, and she's describing it as though it had already happened. Because God's promise is that sure and secure. Due to the mighty, great power of her great God, Mary understood that the work that her son was coming to do was as good as accomplished the haughty and the proud will be humbled in the sight of our great God. And think about how Theophilus, this man of standing, this man of status, might need to hear this word. Frankly, think about how we, coming from a country of great wealth and great benefits, might need to hear this word. You might say, well, I'm not rich. Well, when you compare yourself to the rest of the world, you are. And this text should humble us and confront us with how often we rely on the things that God has provided rather than our God. Those who exult in themselves and boast of who they are and how great they are and how great their armies are will be brought low and humbled. But those who fear the Lord, who worship the Lord, who reverence themselves before the Lord, who submit themselves wholly and completely to the Lord will be exalted in this theme of this reversal, this divine reversal, this upending of the ways of the world is going to play itself out throughout the entirety of this gospel 
this loving concern of God for the needy is going to come out over and over and over again. And hopefully for those of us who are very prone to think that we can depend on ourselves, we will be reminded over and over and over over the next year how often we need to have a reset and recognize that everything we have is a gift from God and that we can't rely on the gift. We must rely on the giver. And so we get there to the end of our hymn. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. You see, this story is really nothing new. It's just the completion of one that God had promised to complete for a very, very long time. You see, God's word is true. And we may live, we may not live, to see all of the things that God has promised be accomplished. But we can know, those of us who reverence God, who fear God, who are submitting to Him and walking in fellowship with Him, we can know that God's Word is true. And in the end, God is going to set all things right. You see, the way to justice is not at the point of a sword. The way to justice ultimately is not through societal change. It's through the coming of God to his people. It's through the coming of the true and good king. Because you see, when we make those replacements, our tendency will be to just replace one oppressor with another. But when the true king comes, when the king who is perfect comes, when the one who is God comes to his people and dies in their place so that, as Paul says, he can be the just and the justifier of those who have have faith in Jesus, then true peace, true justice can come. The peace on earth that the angels will declare will come to pass in perfection forever. And even though we haven't seen our king yet return in power, his return is just as sure as the events that we've just examined today. And we can declare with just as much surety as Elizabeth did and Mary did that these things are an accomplished reality And they will be. And as a result of that, we can live with hope. We can live with joy. We can live with confidence. Regardless of all of the tumult around us. Regardless of all the storms that engulf us. We can live in hope. Because Jesus is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the midst of a trying week filled with lots of strange, unexpected events, things that we would not have hoped for, things that we would not have expected, and frankly, things that make us kind of angry. I pray today Father, good Father, that through your Spirit, you would, as you did with Elizabeth, point us to God the Son. Point us to Him as our hope. Point us to Him as our satisfaction. Point us to Him as our joy.
And Lord, I pray that in your kindness, you would cause your joy to shine through us in such a powerful way that 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 joy of what it means to live under the kingship of Christ would be so real, so palpable that your spirit would use it to overcome all of the, the social stories that folks might have heard or might have experienced of Christians who are angry, frustrated, mean. And maybe not even Christian at all. So that they could see you and your beauty. So that they could see that the paths that they're on in search of satisfaction, in search of meaning, in search of purpose, are never going to lead to what they desire. Because they're not the path that you have for them. And Lord, that you would You would use us as conduits of your grace and conduits of your peace to see folks come to faith. To see their path detoured into the path of Jesus for their everlasting joy and their everlasting satisfaction. And Lord, I just pray this morning that it, it and that this prayer honestly would would still be heard any time in the future that this sermon is seen or heard. That you would intervene in the lives of believers and and more importantly, even in the lives of unbelievers. And that you would use this, these weak words of a weak man, to bring people from life or from death into life. We pray this, we long for this, we beg for this in the name of Jesus. Who is here and who is God. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. And I think.